Hey everyone, this is Ross, and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast-style video that I do for you guys. Every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern, we talk a lot about fruits and a lot about vegetables and how to use all that stuff in the kitchen, and also how to grow these weird and interesting fruits, especially the weird and interesting fruits, because usually you can't find those things in the store, and you have to grow them yourself to really experience the full flavor. Uh, we grow food. Food that we can't really grow or shouldn't be able to grow, but also food that we really value for the flavor. We really go through, um, you know, crazy lengths to find the right varieties, the right genetics that have that superior flavor. Um, with also combined with the right techniques. And in fact, tonight's episode of Fruit Talk, we're going to be talking about some of those techniques that I use on my figs. And that's actually what our episode's going to be about tonight is a, a recap of my fig season of 2019. Um, it's pretty much over. Um, if you kind of look at the temperatures in the Philadelphia area, they certainly have cooled down at night. Um, this is just normally what happens. And it's been actually quite extended for about three weeks. I would say on average around September 15th, things really cool down. They really get rainy. And our season pretty much abruptly ends. It's really sad because uh, it kind of comes out of nowhere every year. This year, we did get some cooler weather around September 15th, but uh, things stayed warm and they stayed dry. And as a result, our figs were able to, to continue to thrive. Um, so uh, at this point, though, now that it's uh, October 8th, at least at the date of filming, I can honestly say that this is pretty much the end. There's very few figs that I'm going to get at this point. Um, however, I did move a lot of my trees and we have a video that maybe it came out this morning, um, Wednesday morning, I should say, the, the 9th, um, talking about um, moving some of those trees actually into the greenhouse and getting that greenhouse heat, um, increasing the metabolisms of some of these trees so that I can continue my fig season on a few select late varieties. Um, there, I do have some late varieties that have plenty of fruit on them because they're so late and they really need a, a greenhouse head start in the beginning of the season and to be finished off in the greenhouse. It's really just insane um, how much length of season they need. Um, even in really warm Mediterranean climates, these varieties will not finish their entire crop. So knowing all that, I think it's important to it really put some, put some of these varieties into perspective. But, you know, there, there are varieties, of course, that I want to have them ripen. They're so tasty, let's say, as an example, that it's definitely worth sticking them in the greenhouse. And you know what? It's not the end of the world. It's not really a whole lot of work. I'm just moving them from one place to the other. And um, they're getting that benefit. Um you know, I still have roughly two more months before everything will be put away for good this winter time. Um, you know, around December 1st, sometimes even around Thanksgiving, we get a crazy frost that comes in, a, a crazy low temperature that really scares me sometimes. But as long as we stay above about 15 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm pretty confident that we'll be okay. Um, 17 to be safe. Um, I've even I've experienced last year all the way down to 14 and everything seemed to be fine but that's usually around the time December 1st where things get put away for good and at that point um, we'll be able to pretty much finish those varieties those varieties in the greenhouse now will likely finish their entire crop like black Madeira Syndrosa I have a uh, Fico Rubato in there Babera Branca um, just a few varieties that uh, really seem to be extremely late and really not worth growing here. Um, of course, if they're really tasty like Black Madeira, I think it's totally worth it. Like De La Senora Hivernenka, um, that's another one that is extremely late, but it seems to be very much so worth growing. Excuse me, guys. Um, so let's kind of get on to now the techniques that we were recapping the season. I want to talk about the techniques that we we learned and different, you know, just principles, rules that we we uh, really refined and things that are really important to me 
that we learned this year. You know, there's of course many more techniques that we've talked about over in the past, but uh, these are the ones that really hit home with me this year. And it's it's crazy. You kind of know that some of these are true, at least the information's out there somewhere. But until you really see it yourself, it doesn't really click exactly um, like anything in life. You know, I also have down towards the bottom of the post, we're going to talk about some varieties that really were a success for me this year. Um, this is going to be probably a long one. We also have some information that's going to be coming in future episodes. You know, things like what I'm getting rid of, what varieties I'm getting rid of, which ones I'm keeping, some data on certain varieties, the ratings, you know, what are my favorite honey figs? I mean, it kind of goes on and on. Um, this is kind of just going to be a nice little um, point of reference here for people that are interested. So the first technique that I like to use, and we talk a lot about this, is just using minimal and consistent watering. Uh, consistent water. We need to have a minimal and consistent soil moisture um, with our figs. And if you do that, it's consistent all the time for the entire length of the season. And you're keeping the water low. You're keeping it moist, but not wet, um, not too dry. But on the drier side of moist, you're going to have the best quality you can attain. You're going to have lower splitting. Um, and one way that I was able to achieve this this year was with the trash bags. We put trash bags on top of our potted trees. And that kept out a lot of the rain. Not all of it, but it was very easy to control the soil moisture that way. It did attract a, a number of mosquitoes. It, it really wasn't uh, pleasant. But I just had to go outside basically with just long sleeves and long pants every day. Um, there's got to be a better way to be doing this so that the water doesn't sit there. Um, however, this is definitely a wonderful uh, way of keeping out the rain that we have. We just get too much rain and it's therefore very difficult to keep our soil moisture the right moisture content. Um, it just rains too much here and even last year I didn't have to water a single potted tree until about June 1st and I stopped my watering by September 1st so I only water my potted trees three months out of the year um, which is kind of crazy to think about um, that even my potted trees don't really need a whole lot of water this year was a very it was very dry and that would have been a bit different However, I believe this really helped, and I'm, I'm not entirely sure if this is the, the trash bags are further reducing splitting, like even further than having the right moisture content, but it certainly helps achieve that right moisture content. Um, SWD, this is uh, something that I deal with every year. We talk a lot about this. This is nothing new. The splitting really is nothing new. You know, having the right moisture content, I knew that for a while. Um, the SWD, this is just something that happens with the black cherry tree in the backyard. Puts out thousands of cherries that nothing really eats. They drop to the ground. They ferment. It attracts fruit flies. The fruit flies then multiply a number, um, and then the issue becomes an issue. Um, and then they go after different fruits. When the cherries are gone, like my strawberries, my mar de bois, um, the raspberries, the blackberries, the figs and um, it just becomes an issue but as long as you're not contributing to the problem you know uh, I think they'll eventually go away and you can set out some traps the traps definitely help uh, especially you know as soon as you put that trap out at least I find the numbers dramatically decrease um, you know if you can really increase the sunlight to that area that your fruits are growing in you know that's awesome uh, you know rain is a bad one decaying leaves is a bad one you know shade of course fermenting fruit um, cracked fruit and split fruit all make the issue kind of worse so gather up all your fermenting fruit throw them in a bucket and let them ferment and draw in those fruit flies uh, another thing here that's overlooked a lot is the cracking that we see on our figs and a lot of people love the look of it they think it's beautiful but it's really not beautiful when you're having to pick your figs one to three days earlier because they have giant cracks in them or many cracks in them. Here in my humid climate, 
Um, it makes drying and shriveling my figs, I should say. I really should say shriveling. That's probably the best term because um, we'll never really get a true dried fig here. But it makes it very, very difficult to achieve. And, you know, um, even something as like having low bricks. And if you don't, if you water your trees too much, you're going to have a low bricks, a lower bricks anyway. So it's really a whole process of um, stopping the cracking, lowering the water, um, making sure that they don't split. And the quality for this, for me this year, was the highest it's ever been. And the cracking is really all about having too much nitrogen. Also, the temperature swings are something that you can't really help. But um, certainly later in my, in my season, when things go from quite hot to very cold at night, um, that is a big temperature swing. Let's say, you know, we have uh, normally nights in the 60s or in the 70s, and then they suddenly go to the 50s, and even the daytime temperatures are quite cold. Uh, maybe it has something to do with the atmospheric pressure. I'm not entirely sure. But it seems like for sure that the uh, temperature swings, at least on those nights that that happens, you see a lot of cracking. Um, often you know very large cracking and this to me um, in, in addition to the excess nitrogen is really the biggest culprits of, of getting this cracking um, so what I did this year to avoid almost all cracking I had almost no cracking this year on my varieties um, you know from pretty much the beginning of my season in July to about September 1st when in September we started to get some some nice temperature swings and that's why some of the cracks showed up on those on those particular figs but for the most part I get almost none and yeah some varieties will naturally do this a bit more than others but um, this is really really key for me was not feeding my trees too much nitrogen I did four feedings in the beginning of the year, only in June. I did it once a week in in the duration of the month of May, and that was it. And that was enough to get my figs well fed, put out enough fruit, and then not have the crazy cracking that you see um, on pretty much everybody else's figs. It's just uh, it's crazy. Um, I was really surprised by this. This was a big point that hit home for me this year. Another one that was hitting home was uh, having a short hang time. We talk about hang time. I define it as the amount of days it takes from when the fig begins swelling to fully ripe. So green, hard, to fully ripe. Um, figs with a three to six day hang time are ideal. I think around seven days or more, it really starts to get a bit sketchy because around seven days, we usually get some rain. Um, at least once every seven days, something like that. Um, it seems to be like that where we at least get some sort of rainfall every week. Um, you know, also the longer the hang time, the more susceptible these figs are to pests. So just like, you know, f different figs have different ripening periods and have different hardiness ratings and different rain resistance, they also have a different hang time. And when the temperatures cool down, the hang time increases. So it's a bit difficult to get high quality figs late in the season because something's just going to happen. It's going to rain or it's going to get attacked by some kind of critter, insects, uh, you name it. So it becomes very difficult. And I just think that this number should be pretty much as low as possible to ensure the highest quality. This is... Um, the highest quality for the entire duration of the year and I had a few disappointments this year that have long hang time like uh, Suwadi and White Triana which were two figs that I really love and I loved them last year and they were totally different this year largely due to the fact that they have such a large hang time and they weren't able to ripen in a period of dry weather and as a result they didn't they didn't do n n nowhere near as well as they tasted. They weren't anywhere in the same class as they were last year um, when they had ripened. 
Um, in terms of pruning and other techniques, we talk a lot about them in these two different threads here. Um, we talked a lot about pruning and heating the soil in the spring. Heating the soil in the spring is very, very important. Pruning should be very light, really kept to a minimum, really just taking off the tips, the growth tips, um, the apical buds, or no more than three inches of growth. Anything more than this, so we're really starting to limit the productivity, um, at least the quantity, I should say, the quantity of our figs. Um, also, with too hard of a pruning, we get very vigorous shoots the next year, and those vigorous shoots don't fruit nearly as well or nearly as productively. Um, in fact, they may not fruit at all, depending on the variety uh, in my climate. Uh, and it does depend on the variety. It doesn't. It's not the same applicable, you know, um, techniques that should be used on every single variety. But um, just as a general rule of thumb, I think pruning should be much lighter. You know, in addition, in my climate, keeping the apical buds and not pruning off the tips is going to aid you in getting earlier figs. Um, so, in you know, in a nutshell, pruning too hard pretty much gets you later figs and less figs. Um, so if you're pruning for growth, I would suggest you know going out there and, and pruning pretty hard. Um, there's another method of pruning here that we talk about called rejuvenation pruning. We just did a video on this. And uh, Pons mentions this in his book, and it's really an extremely helpful technique that I think is, I may, I may consider this a standard practice that I will use every year after I root a fig is that I root a fig out for for one year let it grow and the following year I chop that fig all the way down to the base and let it re-sprout from the base usually a very healthy vigorous shoot um, I choose the right one and that becomes the new trunk or stem of the tree and um, that then sets up the tree for a very healthy productive um, vigorous lifestyle from that point onwards for years it just sets the tree up for a much better point um, you know this is a method that is usually used for in-ground trees that are 30 to 40 years old and they get so old and they get they lose their vigor they become gnarly and they maybe become a little bit disease ridden or maybe the soil is a bit weak um, this is a really good technique to really encourage the tree to reinvigorate itself, rejuvenate itself. And I kind of think of it as a reset switch. And um, I did it this year in my planera tree. It worked wonderful, wonderful, uh, wonderfully. And um, it should be back to normal next year. Um, I'm going to be doing this on a couple trees, really pruning out areas that I can hopefully accurately identify when I do my pruning. I can accurately identify some problem points on the tree and perhaps I could reinvigorate the tree um, in some of these varieties that way. So um, this is something that I think is just immensely important, not really talked about almost ever. Um, so uh, let's see, what else here? I also learned this year that my in-ground trees can produce almost as early as my potted trees, maybe about two weeks later and um, not only that but they have about the same harvest period um, they can also not only do they fruit two weeks later but they also continue for two weeks longer in the ground because the soil in the ground is still a bit warm unlike the potted trees uh, another big thing that we learned this year was sap flow control and hormonal control um, we talked about girdling in a video that we did recently. Uh, we also kind of didn't really mention it in this post, but we talked a lot about lignification. And basically, almost every single one of my varieties is lignified. Um, I didn't mention that. I guess I should in this post. Because we had really not fertilized them all that much, they got lignified in time. And it's really a night and day difference, some of these varieties and how much they look. And we didn't remove the fruits that weren't going to ripen in time. Um, we pretty much tried to stop every one of our trees from growing. 
after a certain point of the season, and it, it worked out really well. Um, in addition, the sap flow control, you know, this is really important in the beginning of the season. I think no matter what I do, my in-ground trees are going to have to be cut back to the base. Um, yeah, it would be nice if some of them survived the winter and they became large trees, you know, but that's not likely going to happen. And my most reliable source of figs next year, or large amount of figs next year, so I can sell them commercially, is going to be from these in-ground trees. So the best method I can do that I know of is to protect them. And essentially by chopping them all down to the base, a mass form of protection, an easier method of protection is to just cut them all down to the base, six to 12 inches off the ground, and then cover them. And that's going to protect them. Um, but that's also a form of hard pruning. We talked about how hard pruning is not really beneficial, right? We lose productivity. We lose earliness. Uh, we lose a lot of things. So what you have to do as the grower, when you, this is something that happens, you have to correct the course that your tree is now on by changing up the hormones, um, by controlling the sap flow. And I think one of the best tools that we can use is girdling, but not necessarily girdling because I've learned that with this new and tender growth that comes out after dormancy, it's really just too tender at that point to girdle it. So the best advice I think we can do is actually to make small incisions with our knife um, and just kind of draw a line up the bark. You know, if this pen, as an example, is let's say this pen is the is the branch, the new growth, I'm going to take my knife and just score the bark down this way and maybe even down this way you're not going to take off an entire layer of bark, a flat layer of bark. You're going to take the knife and just make a sharp cut. Like if this is the, if this is the, um, the knife, look how thin that is, right? I'm just going to make one thin incision down the side in other different directions. And that's going to help this, the, uh, the tree bleed a bit. It's going to lose some of that sap flow, which I think is often too strong. Um, so if we lower that vigor, we lower that sap flow a bit, uh, we can slow the tree down and kind of recorrect this course that it's on. And um, that will just pretty much set itself up for a, a very fruitful year. Um, so I, I'm going to have to do that on a number of these varieties for sure. Um, it'll be a nice experiment next year and that will really be the real test for this if it really works. What I noticed this year is that pinching some of the tips off and letting them bleed that way was enough to kind of trigger them back into a normal fruiting mode um, instead of just vigor, vigor, vigor. So um, yeah, we'll see how this all works out, but it'll be an interesting little test for sure. Um, I also learned that rootstock is extremely important. Certain varieties need more water, certain varieties need more fertilizer. Uh, a more fertile soil. Certain varieties are not really that vigorous. They don't have strong root systems. Certain varieties are just very finicky in general. They just need their, their higher maintenance varieties but because of their genetics, because of where they've adapted. Um, you know, it just uh, is a bit of a shame, but I've realized that there's a number of varieties that I have to stick them in the greenhouse. I have to feed them more and I have to graft them. You know, um, if I do graft them, they won't have to be fed nearly as much. They won't have to be watered nearly as much uh, because that root stock that's on the bottom is really going to control all that now. Um, and I think that's just makes, it just makes everything much easier. If I were to graft every single variety I have on the same root stock, um, it would make things a joke actually to maintain. I think everything would be a lot easier to maintain. Rootstock is completely underrated. Every variety should be grafted onto a rootstock. Um, it took me years to realize this, and um, I'm glad I did. Uh, let's see here. So let's go back. We also learned about a another technique of growing figs in containers, and there's two very common methods. I think we may have actually mentioned this in... Um, 
one of our episodes of Fruit Talk, and I've kind of talked about method A and method B, and how one of the methods is fertilizing a lot, one of them's fertilizing a minimal amount, um, one of them pinches and one of them doesn't. One of them thins new shoots and one of them really doesn't. So it's a very different take on the whole thing and uh, one method essentially nets you more fruits, but the other method, the method I use, will net you less fruits, but at an earlier date. And I'd rather have, like it is right now, October 8th, I'd rather have all my figs ripen before October 1st, before September 15th, actually. Because September 15th is normally October 8th, but we got really lucky this year. This is the, the dream scenario. This is the best fig season, the best weather I've ever been a part of uh, when growing figs. So it's really it's really just important uh, in my climate, I think, to be doing Method A, but there are varieties like uh, Floria and Improved Celeste and Ron de Bordeaux and Hardy Chicago. The very, very early varieties, I think we could do Method B2 and really get away with it and get a lot more fruit this way. And it may, you know, just totally be worth it to have instead of... Um, you know, instead of having all the varieties, every tree I have with the same techniques used to just switch it up a bit. You know, have one tree, let's say we stick it in the greenhouse. That's a very early variety. Let's take Ronde Bordeaux. We stick it in the greenhouse. It fruits by July 1st. Then we have a Ronde Bordeaux using method A. It fruits by August 1st. Then we have a Ronde Bordeaux using method B. It fruits by August 15th. But the Ronde Bordeaux that is fruiting August 15th puts out 200 fruits, right? So it's a really, uh, I think, an interesting way to think about this. And um, just in general, we shouldn't really be, we should be more flexible in the techniques that we employ. We can't use the same mold for every tree in every location. And it just goes, the whole, everything I just mentioned to you guys from the start of this video to now, the same methodology can be applied you know we can't use the same techniques for everything so even if I mention this to you guys and this is all really important not everything really is going to be perfect in a perfect little world you may have to prune your trees a bit more because you may have some height concerns maybe you don't want your tree to get out of control um, you know maybe you guys live in a warm climate and short hang time really isn't that all that important um, or dry climate you know, uh, I think though these are pretty general rule of thumbs um, that I mentioned, but for the most part, it's it's up to you guys as the grower and where you guys live. We also talked about and we're we're gonna finish the technique section now. We're gonna move on to a few synonyms. We talked about some synonyms that are kind of floating around the community, things like Borgia Soak Grease and Violet Support. I think this year, after tasting them side by side, we did a video on this. I think they're the same. Um, I'd be very hard pressed to think that they weren't. Uh, however, I know a few very experienced growers who have actually seen the tree side by side and it's hard to argue with. Even the photos I've seen, it's just very dumb. I'm dumbfounded because they both are so close that it's crazy. Um, but I, I don't want to believe it just yet because I know that there's so many experienced people who say that they're not the same. Yellow long neck and golden rainbow was another one. And we did a review also on YouTube. They're, um, if they're not exactly the same fig, the at the very least they're a um, one of them has a minor adaptation that the other doesn't. You know, like um, kind of like the Hardy Chicago types, how they're ninety nine point nine percent similar, but they have, you know, that point one percent or point zero one percent that. Um, I should say that 1% of the fig that is just, you know, it is what it is, right? It's just got this different characteristic to it that makes it slightly different than the others because of where it's adapted and how long it's been growing in that location. Um, now we can to go move on to some others. Oh, I, I do want to mention Izmir. I did get to, ri to ripen some Izmir figs this year. And Izmir was a bit... Um, disappointing actually it ripened very late um, my real is mirror at least that's what I believe is that there's a there's a real is mirror and there's an is mirror not is what we call it 
And um, the Izmir not fruited, and the Izmirs, the real Izmirs, had dropped their fruit. Um, so I'm kind of done with Izmir. I'm over it. Um, even the Izmir not didn't really seem as impressive as last year, but that's only because it's been so late. And if I can get it earlier, it's going to be a really impressive fig. It's very similar to the Colden Alms, potentially even better. Um, so I'm excited for it next year, but um, I did get a closer look at that variety and um, also the two of them compared to each other. And it's they're showing more similar characteristics, but one of them's been dropping figs and one of them's not. So I'm kind of done with that comparison, at least myself. I could care less at this point if they are indeed the same or if they are different. I just want the one that's going to fruit. Uh, moving on now to my favorite varieties of the year. We had figs like uh, Black Madeira, which is just honestly has the best flavor. Um, followed up by the Col de Dames, Noir, Grease, Blanc. Uh, they have the best texture. They have a, also a really awesome flavor. The texture I would consider elegant, pasty, dense, cakey, jammy. Just a very thick fig. Um, unlike many other fig varieties. And I've been trying to find some that are so similar but less finicky. And that's where De La Roca comes in. It seems to be better here. It's uh, a tree that's been growing in more of a humid area in Spain um, because of where it is. And Pons mentions that actually. And it has seemingly a more, it's more productive. It's less finicky and has a, a short hang time. Believe it or not, only like five to six days maybe. And it can dry on the tree here. Um, it has the ability to dry, which is incredible. And this fig I had right here was just as good, if not better, than the best fig I had this year, which was a, a Col de Dame Grease. Um, some others that we had earlier in the year that were really spectacular were Sucret. Um, pretty sure this is the same thing as Col Noir. It has a, another very similar thick, dense, jammy texture. Not as dense as the Col de Dames, though but it's got good flavor. It has the ability to dry on the tree. It's very productive and it doesn't seem that late. Neruchiola de Elba, a very small fig, consistently small, but it has one of the best flavors. Um, what I find to be the most interesting point of this fig is that it goes from green and hard to red to black to dry in only about six days. It shrivels on the tree in about six days after swelling. It's very vigor. Um, it's has low vigor, but puts out a lot of fruit and a close spacing. It's probably the perfect fig in this climate. Um, it's small. It doesn't split. It's rain resistant. It has the ability to dry. Um, it's just incredible in this climate. And I, I hope that there's something better, but I would be very hard pressed to say that there is. Um, LSU Tiger. This is the best LSU fig that I grow. And I think it's the best LSU fig, period. Um, it has a really awesome Concord Berry flavor to it. Um, I've only tasted that Concord Berryness in my Azores Dark, and they can dry up on the tree pretty well. It takes a few years to mature. They're beautiful. Um, just a wonderful fig. Everything about it is wonderful. An earliness, rain resistant, you, you name it. I also have a fig called Albo, which has been a wonderful fig this year. It's a honey fig combined with fruity berry tones. I have another fig called LSU Huye, which is another LSU fig, which is very, very similar in terms of flavor. I can't decide which one I like more. They both seem early. They definitely are early, both of them. And I can't really gauge their, their rain resistance and split resistance just yet. The both of them had a little bit of a, an issue this year, but nothing crazy. And, you know, they're both wonderful figs for sure. Uh, I just hope that the rain resistance on one of them solves itself. And it's, it's just a, due to the fact that they're both sort of immature um, at this point. Uh, another fig I like is Hated the Argentile, which just has like the most unusual cherry flavor to it. Kind of like cherry candy and has a ton of honey. It's super soft. Uh, it's stupidly beautiful. 
It's my mom's favorite fig. My mom doesn't even like figs, believe it or not, and she loves this one. Kind of crazy. Um, it's actually the only acidic fig. Um, well, the only acidic fig that I'm going to be keeping, at least thus far. Things like Cavalieri and Rubato um, have a very similar flavor, but uh, they're much later and have other issues with them. Hate of the Argentile does well in the rain. It doesn't split. Um, it's got nice size to it. It's also mid-season, reliably mid-season. Um, but the only issue with it is it has to be grafted. The difference between my ungrafted Hate of the Argentile and my grafted Hate of the Argentile is just astronomically different. Um, we also have the Daloso that I was really impressed with. Kind of its own unusual flavor. Never really picked up a flavor like this before. Um, it also seems early and rain resistant. And um, I just love it. I think it's great. Another fig that reminds me of that is almost the Moro de Caneva that we talked about in a video recently. It kind of the both of them sort of remind me of a Violet de Bordeaux, but but slightly different. But Moro de Caneva reminds me more of a Violet de Bordeaux, but it's better. It's better than a Violet de Bordeaux in terms of flavor. I'm shocked. It dries on the tree. Um, it has great rain resistance, and it's early and productive. I mean, it's everything you'd want in a fig, and it could be also extremely hardy. Pastelier, this is another fig, very dense pasty texture people say uh, mine has been a bit dense but it's also been a bit um, you know kind of juicy and honey filled I should say um, so I kind of more of the denser figs have less of that honey in them um, which I think aids in the texture of getting that straight jam texture so I'm waiting for mine to mature believe it or not it's four years old and that's how long this thing takes I think five years <coughs> oh, excuse me guys oh. <coughs> all right okay I think we're all right guys <laughs> my grandma by the way will sneeze sometimes like 10 15 times in a row um, so if you're out there like that you're not alone um, let's see okay so Sakura black is another one that reminds me a lot of Smith and Smith is at this current moment, still my best overall fig. But it, this is slightly later. It's larger. Um, it's fantastic. It's incredible. Socorro Black. Um, LSU Huye, we talked about. Verdino del Nord, this is another fig that's like uh, Neruccio de Elba. And they're very small, consistently very small. And they just pack a punch, man. They have an incredible flavor to them. They both dry on the tree, very short hang time. Verdino del Nord is extremely jammy. That is like the jammiest fig I think I have. Um, Campaneri is another one that's a lot like Smith in the texture and the flavor. It's gonna be a wonderful variety here. Um, it's probably gonna beat out every other fig I have um, at least well, it may not, but it's going to be a top contender. I think Neruccio de Elba is going to be number one, actually, at this point. But Camp Maneri could be could be there as well. I'm not entirely sure just yet. Um, Neruccio de Elba just seems like its own little animal, man, because it's so small. It really um, just does wonderful here. It's just cra it's crazy. Um, really, the smaller the fig, the better for the most part in this climate. Uh, De La Senora Hibernenka, this is another one we talked about, I think, earlier in the video. It's got like a black Madeira flavor, very short hang time, and it doesn't really mind the cooler nights. It just does well, but it's extremely late, stupidly late, and without a greenhouse, I wouldn't grow it here. Uh, Blanche de du Cezanne, that's another incredible fig, very close to the Col de Dames, probably second to my De La Roca behind uh, the De La Roca. Um, it's really good. Great flavor, great texture. Close to the consistency of jam. 
Uh, other favorites I have that I really like this year, and I've liked them every year, is Violet de Bordeaux, Ron de Bordeaux, Long de Dute, Azores Dark, Smith, uh, Delson Waming Ron. And the two new ones this year were Galicia Negra and Martinenka. I was a bit impressed by both of them. Um, we'll see if they both can really match up to the quality of these. Delson Wamigran, I'm finding, and I've read through Pons' book, that he actually recommends that you need to feed it well. It needs to be well fed. So I am tempted to graph some of them. And it maybe it should be a variety that's on its own rootstock. Um, so that's kind of the end of the video here, guys, of this episode of Fruit Talk. We talked a lot about the techniques and some synonyms I came across, my favorite figs. Um, it's just been a wonderful, wonderful season. We're going to come at you guys with uh, maybe a few more techniques later down the road. We're going to talk about some data, some ratings and things that I've been collecting. I've been collecting data this season. <clears throat> we'll talk about the uh, similarities in flavor and similarities in some varieties to others and that will all then kind of lead into making my uh, coal list very easy, the varieties that I'm going to get rid of. Um, that was the whole objective with this season was to gather as much information as possible so that I could make the best educated uh, decisions on what to get rid of. So, guys, thank you so much for watching this one. Check out the blog, figboss.com. This will be posted there on the blog as well as the future um, things that we're going to be mentioning. So subscribe to the blog down at the bottom. You just put in your email. Also, consider supporting us on Patreon. I really would appreciate it. Even a dollar, two dollars a month is really um, much appreciated. It really helps out the podcast, make me do this every uh, each and every week for you guys. So if you really enjoy it, no pressure, but uh, it would mean a lot to me. And we'll see you all for next week's episode. All right, guys. Uh, take care.